Good evening, everybody. I'm Brian Bowman, and welcome to the latest edition of the Amherst Wire UVC TV series, Professors in Politics. Coming up later, we will be joined by Diane Curtis to talk about reproductive law. Diane Curtis, for now, uh, sorry about that. For now, I'm joined by Professor Paul Musgrave, uh, a political science professor here at UMass, to talk about the implications of Donald Trump's presidency on U.S. foreign policy. Professor Musgrave is a former editor for Foreign Affairs magazine. His work has appeared in numerous academic journals, Slate, and The Washington Post. He also recently appeared on CNN and MSNBC. Professor Musgrave, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. It's a real privilege. Wonderful to be here. So the first question I want to ask you is about Russia, a subject that's really dominated the news cycle lately and the Trump administration's supposed ties mm -hmm. to the Russian government. I'm hoping that you can sort of help us separate sensationalism and hysteria and sort of conspiracy thinking and reality and what if anything really concerns you most about this issue? Well let's step back for a second. Um, there's a lot of stuff that people have put out, there's a lot of stuff floating around on social media, a lot of people are really just obsessed with this idea that somehow like Donald Trump is Vladimir Putin's puppet or like Russia is controlling it. Let's step back. Over the last 25 years we've seen the United States and Russia after the end of the Cold War, moved steadily toward a more antagonistic relationship. And since 2013, 2014, with a clash in a country that Americans don't really think about, Ukraine, that relationship has become really acutely hostile. And so, in 2016, the evidence seems pretty clear on a circumstantial basis. Vladimir Putin decided that his number one rival in the United States, Hillary Clinton, if she became president, when she became president, was going to do so under a cloud. And he wanted that for a very specific reason. Because Hillary Clinton was somebody who was strongly anti-Putin, somebody who was strongly in favor of U.S. interventionism overseas in places like Libya, in places like Syria, and in places like, like Ukraine. And so Vladimir Putin wanted to make sure that America as a model for democratic practice, America as a force that would stand up to Russia, would be as weak as it could be. And so Putin tried to do everything he could to weaken the American democratic process. And that's really what I think people need to be focusing on, which is that this is not a rivalry between Putin and Hillary Clinton, although there's an element of that. This is not a friendship between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. This is Vladimir Putin carrying out in the United States a strategy that he has taken to France, to Germany, to Hungary, across Eastern Europe, of trying to weaken the democratic model that the West represents. And he wants to do this because the first thing that Vladimir Putin fears when he wakes up and the last thing that he fears when he goes to bed is the idea that Russia will succumb to what's called a color revolution, to this idea that somehow popular po protests in Moscow and St. Petersburg and elsewhere will overthrow his regime. And so, in July 2016, WikiLeaks, which at this point it seems clear should be regarded as fundamentally part of Russian intelligence, released emails that they had hacked from the Democratic National Committee, tremendously embarrassing DNC chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and really making it much harder for Hillary Clinton to say that she had run a clean campaign. The biggest unexplained question here is why Donald Trump and the Republican Party, from Paul Ryan down to precinct committeemen, decided that this was something that they would let stand. And it's the fact that the Republican Party, and again, mostly but not entirely Donald Trump, has decided to go along with this campaign put forward by Vladimir Putin and his agencies that's really troubling. So there's a lot of things going on with the United States and Russia. It goes from everything from the sanctions that the United States put in place in response to Russia's blatant invasion and annexation of Crimea, all the way down to the stuff that we're talking about even today. I'm not even sure if Director Comey has stopped testifying yet, but the sorts of things that we're talking about right now where there are rumors that somehow, in fact, Russian intelligence has pulled off the intelligence coup of the century, maybe of the millennium, in intervening just enough to get their favored candidate elected president of the United States.
Thank you for that insight. Um, I'd like to ask you now about terrorism. Um, over the course of his campaign, Donald Trump espoused a lot of anti-Muslim rhetoric, and since being elected president, he surrounded himself with by, with people like Steve uh, Stephen Miller and mm -hmm. Steve Bannon, who sort of buy into this idea of a clash of civilizations, mm -hmm. of the West versus Islam. They're not inherently compatible. Do you think that that sort of rhetoric and these sorts of policies that they're starting to introduce, that seems to be sort of blanket anti-Islam, have the potential to inflame tensions and exacerbate terrorism rather than make us safer here in the United States? Well, I think that this is exactly the right way to be framing the question. And there are a lot of people around President Trump. Um, you mentioned some of them, Steve Bannon, uh, Steve Miller. There's other people who have started to get more attention, like Sebastian Gorka who works for, uh, for Steve Bannon uh, in what's called the Strategic Review Group. These are guys who are, some of them have merely troubling ties to the far right. Some of them, it seems to be, are literal members of neo-Nazi groups. And their idea is very simple. You express it quite well. This idea of the clash of civilizations. This is an idea that goes back to Samuel Huntington, who wrote this article and then this book in 1993, 1996, talking about this idea that somehow the West would confront Islam. And this is something that people have taught, maybe more than we should have over the last two decades, because it's a really influential, completely wrong version of how history works. In fact, the biggest clash of civilization right now is between people in the Muslim world who want to have a world that could be, you know, a society in which they live that could be Muslim, but would not be the kind of fundamentalist, totalitarian threat that ISIS and other groups represent, and ISIS and those other groups. That's the real clash there. You know, it's amazing that Americans and Westerners, when we think about terrorism, we think about 9-11, we think about Bata Khan, we think about all these times when people who identify as Muslim have attacked Westerners. But really, more than 90% of the terrorist incidents that have taken place have taken place where Muslims were predominantly or the only victims in places like Syria and Libya and, of course, Iraq. I mean, this is a story that Americans and Westerners find intuitively compelling, that we are under threat from the Muslim world. But really, terrorists, when they think about this, you know, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, all these guys, when they wake up, they think about how they can carry their struggle to their homeland, not to us. But the Trump administration has seized on the simplistic narrative and they are embracing it in all the worst ways. You know, if ISIS could write American policy, they would choose to have the White House declare that somehow the United States and the West are at war with Islam. That's not the case. That has never been the case of the, you know, 1.2, 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. A vanishingly small percentage of them have ever taken up arms against the United States. But if we frame this debate in the terms that ISIS and Steve Bannon want them to be framed in, if we frame it in that way, then we're looking at something that could be far worse than the Cold War, not only alienating our allies, but creating new enemies. It's really a terrifying prospect. Now, shifting the question to Syria specifically, obviously a country that's just riven in humanitarian disaster, extremely complex war that's going on there. Trump has seemed to signal that he's more willing to cooperate with Russia and the Assad regime than Obama was, who had, of course, armed Syrian rebels in the opposition. Do you think that at this point in the war, it actually may be wise to sort of give up on regime change? And what do you think the consequences of maybe this shifting policy could have on the ground in Syria? This is an excellent question. And there's this world that we live in in which there's an ideal policy. Like, what would I want to have happen if there were a wise and benevolent world regime? And then there's, like, the actual question, which is what's going on. Let me talk about the actual question. I think that Donald Trump is going to take the policy decision that makes him look strong and look decisive regardless of the actual policy content or the consequences even six months down the road. What does that actually look like? I don't know. I think that Putin and the Russian regime took some of the contents of the compliments that Donald Trump had given to Putin over the last several years and interpreted, interpreted that as being friendliness. Actually, I don't think it's anything of the sort. I think that Donald Trump wants to look like a winner. And if that means palling around with Putin, he'll do that. But if that means standing up to Putin, he'll also do that too. And one thing that Donald Trump has been resolute about, 
is the necessity of defeating ISIS. Now, I want to stress that this is something that Donald Trump cannot make happen without committing the United States to a war that would be far more bloody than what we've seen in Afghanistan or Iraq on the part of Americans over the last 10 years. But it does suggest that actually the range of bargains that Putin, Assad, and Trump could come to are a little bit narrower than what people are thinking about. Not least because the United States doesn't want to be cut out of post-war futures in Syria, but also because as much as the Syrian rebels have proven to be a disappointment and in some ways occasionally possibly even worse than ISIS, you can't solve the ISIS problem diplomatically or through force without making sure that there's some coordinated action, some uh, cooperation among the great powers. Russia doesn't seem particularly interested in doing anything but shoring up Assad uh, and using any conflict with ISIS as a way of getting there. But what the Trump administration wants so far, despite all the bluster, despite all of the you know, vitriol, their playbook is basically Barack Obama's with a couple of tweaks at the edges. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen, but for five years, Syria has been a problem for Russia, for the United States, most importantly for the Syrian people. Hundreds of thousands of people have died. Millions of people are displaced. And nobody has come up with a good formula that would actually let the Syrian people return to peace. And it's unlikely that in the next three and a half years we'll come any closer to that kind of resolution. So my last question quickly is something that's not really on a lot of people's radars. And it, that involves the South China Sea and the situation that's becoming more and more and more tumultuous there with China building synthetic islands in order to expand their territorial claim. Um, the U.S. has an ally in the Philippines there, even though that relationship is getting more and more tumultuous as well. Very complex situation. But, I mean, sort of the consequences of a misstep could be actually a war with China, which would obviously be, you know, disastrous on numerous fronts. So I guess my question is, if you were president, how might you sort of handle that situation? And how could you maybe see the Trump administration dealing with this in the future? The South China Sea is an enormously complicated issue, but it boils down to the simple fact that China, its government, claims that large parts of the South China Sea are part of China, um, in part because of territorial claims that no one else accepts and that international tribunals have rejected. But if the Chinese government were to climb down, nationalists in China could threaten the stability of the Chinese government. Donald Trump also doesn't climb down. When you have two great powers that don't want to reach a compromise, that's the worst case scenario. And it seems strange that something as trivial as these islands that are man-made in the South China Sea could lead to a war. But on the other hand, ask Archduke Ferdinand whether he planned to start the First World War. Okay, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Stay tuned. Coming up, um, we're going to have part two of our, of our series.